start with, so we're going to start with a review of what this workshop is about and how we approach alternative splicing, quantifications, and things like that. This is going to be the first part. It's going to take, I don't know, 45 minutes or so-ish, maybe a bit more, depending on how much you ask questions, and you're supposed to be asking questions, so it might take longer. Um, and that's going to be like just a review. It's not going to be any hands-on, so you understand what we're trying to achieve here, how we approach this, and, and what we do. So that will give you time to also fix things. Jordi and Anand that are over there are going to have like the desk over there, so you can trickle down to it if you know you communicate with them one by one, or after we're done with this, we have a you know a five minutes break. You grab some coffee. People who still have a problem can, can set it up while we're doing this, and then we can continue to the next uh, step. So I want us to start so we, we stay on time and we're actually able to give you more rather than less. Um, OK. Here we go. OK, so this workshop is about you know, detection, quantification, visualization of splicing variations. And it's organized by my lab. Um, uh, I'll start you know, before that. I'll say who we are. Uh, so I'm a, an assistant professor here at Penn, uh, joint between the Department of Genetics in the medical school and computer science in the engineering school. I'm Yosef, uh, those of you who haven't met yet. Uh, and the workshop is basically organized by my lab. Uh, anybody from the lab raise hands? Good. So you can see almost everyone. Uh, so the point is we're not a huge lab, uh, but we develop these types of tools. So what we do is we, we specialize in computational analysis of RNA processing with a focus on our RNA splicing. So we build, we use machine learning, which is my background, to build predictive models for splicing variations. And we develop tools for RNA seq data analysis, which we need to feed those models. And this is how we came about developing those tools, which um, seem to be uh, getting a lot of interest and um, a lot of usage. And so we wanted to help the Penn community uh, to use them and have a better understanding of how to use our tools in general, but also how to think and, and do splicing analysis, which is the aim of this workshop. OK, and this is, by the way, uh, all recorded, so uh, mind your language. Yeah, OK, so as, let's start. So what this workshop is not, OK? Because you can do a lot of stuff in RNA-seq, and you know, those of you who are registered and maybe didn't read the, you know, the, the fine print of what you're getting into. Uh, this is not about experimental design for RNA-seq data. This is not about QC for RNA-seq data, not normalization, differential expression of genes, you know, single cell, circular RNAs, non-coding RNAs, none of that, okay? Uh, some of you work in, in bioinformatics core. Uh, some of you do a lot of research on this, write papers on this, uh, and, and have a ton of experience in this and run workshops on this, like Greg over there. And, um, and, you know, they can tell you a lot about this, but we're not going to talk about any of that today. We are going to talk about best practices for detecting, quantifying, and visualizing uh, splicing variants from, uh, and differential splicing from RNA-seq data. Uh, we're going to describe to you different scenarios ranging from very small data sets with or without replicates to large and uh, heterogeneous data sets. Uh, possibly containing hundreds or thousands of samples, like patients and controls. Uh, most of the workshop will focus on the pipelines and the algorithms that we developed in the lab, uh, which are called Magic, and the extension that is coming out soon is called Magic Hat, um, with some some comparisons to other tools, so you you understand, uh, you know why we think it's useful and, and how it compares, at, at least in our hands. Um, we'll give you an emphasis, uh, especially in the first section, about how you can evaluate the tools on your own data set. Because maybe 
you, you, you find that for your specific data set, maybe another tool is, is more relevant so you can take some of the take-home messages from this workshop and, and, and evaluate it for your, you know, your analysis and find something else that works for you. Okay. So the intro, we just went through that. Um, and we're going to give the overview, like I, I said, about how we think about, detect, and quantify and visualize slicing variations. Then we're going to go through usage cases and have some frequently uh, asked questions, troubleshooting, etc. And we encourage a lot of discussion throughout. Okay. So, uh, no. we'll send you later a link where you can make comments and um, suggestions. So, this is from a review from 2014, so it's already not up to date, about many different algorithms um, for RNA sec data analysis, starting from mapping, reconstructing, uh, quantification as comparisons. And you can see a lot of names here, a lot of algorithms, and how they connect to create pipelines for different analysis, starting from how you map it, how you, you know, reconstruct which are the, the isoforms, you can quantify them, and then do differential analysis, etc. And you can see a lot of connections and sub um, sub uh, categories. Um, so the, it's not very important the names of the algorithms or or what's going on there. What's important, I guess, the take home message is that it's it's complex. So this is what the tail, the diagram tells us. There's a lot of things out there, okay. And, um, uh, and we're not going to cover all of them. The other thing to take home is you can see a distinction here that was done in the review between what they call here as events when they're trying to figure out splicing variations between events and isoforms. Okay, so let me just talk a bit about uh, that. So there's two main traditional views for transcriptome variations when people want to study uh, transcriptome variations. There's the isoforms. This is a screenshot from the Genome Browser, which you're used to probably see. You can see tons of different uh, isoforms coming all from the same gene. And um, then there is the more local uh, version, which has been the center of those in, uh, of the study of uh, in the RNA community, people who study alternative splicing, and they've characterized decades ago a specific subtypes of splicing variations that are very common. The green areas here are the green, are the alternatively spliced regions. This is called an exon skipping, where you include or exclude the central exon in the middle. Uh, this is alternative five prime, alternative uh, three prime splice variation, intron retention. And sometimes when people want to go really fancy in these analysis, they say mutually exclusive, which is either you go here or you go here. Okay. And just by looking at this, you can see that there is a huge gap between isoforms and this very simplified view of, of uh, splicing variations. And the point I want to make is that, you know, the holy grail, in a sense, is this. We all want to know what are the isoforms in our data sets and their relative abundance and how they're changing. Okay? That's the best thing. And you're raising your hand? No. Okay. And so... Unfortunately, with RNA-seq data, it's very, very hard. Okay, and it's very hard because the reads are very short, and they have biases, and they're very sparse, and because they're so short, you can't really know from which transcript they came from that list that you're seeing here, right? So for this, you need to build complicated or complex inference algorithms, okay? And a lot of very smart people have built those algorithms, so you can use them right now. The problem is they don't do very well. That has been, you know, our experience and many others. And the reason is it's not because the people who build them are not smart, it's because the problem is just very hard. Okay? So just uh, to make a point here. And so, to sort of bridge the gap between those two things, what we came up with last year in a paper that we published in eLife was sort of an in-between, sort of to bridge the gap between the simplified views of splicing events and full isoforms, and we called it local splicing variations. So what are those units of local splicing variations? It's rather uh, simple and intuitive. Let's say this is a gene splice graph where the uh, rectangles are the exons and the connecting edges are which exon is spliced to which uh, other exon. Okay, this is hopefully something you've seen many times before. And the idea of an LSV is basically every time you see a split 
coming out of an exon, that would be a single source, so this is coming out of this exon, or into an exon, this would be a single target, this is into this exon, we call those an LSV, okay? Local splice variations. They're local because they're always coming from a reference exon that they're coming into or coming out to, out of, okay? And so it's a graph-based definition. It's very simple. It's very intuitive if you just look at this. So it doesn't seem to be a lot into it. But the nice thing about this is it captures all previously defined classical, you know, well-studied AS events type, so this would be, uh, you know, the, the um, one, uh, five prime slice variant, this would be a three prime slice variant, and exon skipping is just a single source and single target from both sides, okay? The nice thing about this is it generalizes to many, many different other types of events. You can capture things that are binary and non-classical, but it involves two, you know, different junctions in both sides, or it can capture things that are complex. By complex, we mean they're non-binary. So notice that very conveniently, all previously studied splicing events are always binary. You skip the exon, you include it. You go to this junction, you go to that junction. There's always two options, which make all the inference and all the computational analysis much simpler. But un unfortunately, life is not like that. So there's a lot of cases where you see complex variations. And by using this definition of local splicing variation units, you can capture them. So you can capture everything that was previously defined, but much, much more. Okay. And so, um, and, and the other thing I want to point out is there is other um, um, uh, appealing reasons to use this LSV definition. As I told you, isoform quantification is very hard because you don't know which read came from which isoform. Okay. Here, this LSV definition also corresponds directly to biology, because if you think of it, every time you see a split, it's basically representing a spliceosome de de uh, decision to which of those possible options am I going to choose and in what ratio. Okay, so the, the graph-based definition corresponds directly to biology, and it also corresponds directly to experimental evidence. And for that, we use junction-spanning reads. So the junction spanning reads from RNA-seq data that span across junctions can tell us or give us a hint that then we can use for our computational analysis for what should be those ratios. And this is what we use in the algorithm. Okay, so the next point is that although complex, you can capture complex variations, you could argue that while this is very uh, appealing in terms of the computational, uh, you know, theoretical definition, it's not really relevant for your work or your research or in general because Let's say these are very rare or irrelevant. So what we've shown in that eLife paper, they're actually very common across the metasomes. So we went all the way from lizard to human. And just by looking at an annotated transcriptome, we, we searched how many of the splicing variations that we can find in annotated transcriptome are actually complex by definition. Now remember, this is no RNA-seq data, so there's no read errors or mapping or anything like that. This is annotated transcriptomes. Okay, and as you can see, if you go to human, even if you just use RefSeq annotation, which is the simplest, more, most com conservative definition that you can use, over 20% of the variations already annotated in RefSeq are complex variations. Okay? And in some cases, you see zeros, but you can see also the numbers don't correspond to the phylogenetic distance. Okay? Now, uh, if you start adding RNA-seq data, even just five or six tissues with no replicates, the number grows substantially up to 30, 40%, depending on the annotation that you can see in, in human. And you can see the numbers jump up. So the numbers actually, and we pointed out in the paper, don't correspond to any phylogenetic distance. They just correspond to basically how well that genome has been annotated and studied. Okay? Okay. It's not just the genome, so it's the transcriptome. Transcript. You're right. So, yeah. So even if you don't know the genome, you can get these numbers. For the so we use so for this we use the transcriptome annotation, like RefSeq or Ensemble, right? But my point is, if the genome is not very well annotated, then it means the trans the transcripts are not well annotated, which means if you just look at the databases, you won't find anything for lizard. If you start looking at data, you finally find a lot of those, which is what you're seeing here. Yeah. What percent of RNA-seq genes are junction-spanned? Uh, 
I don't remember from the top of my head. Uh, Jordy, do you remember numbers? Greg, maybe you remember? Yeah, I would say that, yeah, something like that. If you think, right, uh, um, the average length of uh, a human exon is 145, 147, right? And you have reads that are now 100 bases long, right? So if you, you know, if you take that into account, you're going to get to something, something like that. Yeah. So the number makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And so, okay. So basically, complex LSVs are very common, and you probably don't want to uh, neglect them. That's, uh, that's the bottom line here. And so the other point that I want to make is not only can you find them, they're actually used. Okay? So that's another point we wanted to make in the paper. And for that, we used the splicing quantifications in the algorithm that we're going to describe, Majik. And what we did is we looked across uh, many different tissues, and we looked at... Basically, the idea is instead, we can't say what the function is, but we can say, is the inclusion level changing between different conditions? This is all mouse tissues data, normal tissue data. Okay, and just, just a, a few of those. And so what we said is if it's changing more than 10% across conditions, then it's probably regulated to some extent, or it, it's definitely used at least at 10%. So that would be a proxy for usage. And so if you look at the binary ones and how much they're used in the annotation, it's, you know, around 60, 40% uh, that have a change of more than 10%. If you look at the second most jun used junction in complex ones, you can see it's 60%. The third most ju used junction is, is 20%. And even if you go to the least used, it's still 30%. So if that's a nine-way LSV, that would be the nine least changing junction in that LSV, and still 10% of those make the cut, okay? And if you look at just their inclusion level, saying 10% inclusion or, or, or so is meaningful because it's not just splicing noise that actually use 10% of the time, then you can see the numbers are even, even, um, even higher, okay? So the idea is complex LSVs are very real, and, and the complexity is actually used across many conditions. If you start looking at many conditions, and this is, I would say, a very conservative um, uh, lower bound because this is only a subset of tissues and it's only mouse. Okay. So here is an example of the kind of things that we want to achieve and, and how we go about them. So what you're seeing here is a splice graph, just like the cartoon example. This is a real example of, of um, uh, EIF uh, 4G, which is a translation uh, uh, factor. And you can see again the exons, all the red connections are known in the ensemble annotation. All the green connections here are all the novel stuff. Okay, so things that the algorithm was able to capture and it's not previously annotated, okay? Including internal retention and, and some novel exons and novel connections between exons, okay? And let's focus on this. So this is very complex, as you can see, and this is what we showed in the paper. Now you can see, zoom in, you can see a complex splicing variations between exon not, uh, 8 to exon 14, and uh, uh, this is the validations, RDPCRs that were done by uh, Matt, who's here somewhere. Thank you. And you, you, know, um, you can see different types of um, uh, mouse tissues and brain subregions and the mapping to the various isoforms. Okay? And the point I want to make about this is this complexity with this software you can actually capture and then you can go and validate and it corresponds very nicely, which is something I think you know, just wasn't achievable, not attainable previously. And so the idea is to make all these things uh, available and, and that you can quantify and you can do the RT, RT-PCR experiments, et cetera, and we'll show you the tools that come with it to help you do all this. Okay, so the goals and challenges in order to do all this is, you know, the goal is to detect, quantify, and visualize alternative splicing from rna sick data. And the challenge is, is we want to make it easy to interpret and user-friendly. We want to make it robust, reproducible, and accurate. We want to make it scalable and fast. And our solution, as I mentioned, 
was a set of tools, Magic and Voila, that are two software packages. Magic does all the computational heavy lifting. Voila does all the visualization, so we decouple them. And Magic Spell is a new server-based tool that we'll describe uh, briefly later, which just released like two weeks ago, which enables you to do the uh, experimental design for the RT-PCR validations and connect it to the underlying ISO forms. Um, yeah, and Magic, I haven't mentioned it, stands for Model Alternative uh, Modeling Alternative Junction Inclusion Quantification, which is, of course, just an excuse to write in our papers that we analyze our data using magic. Right. And so, let's talk about visualization. So, issues with current visualization is it's just done like this. This is usually what you see in papers and what you see that tools map the reads to. This is the genome browser, which is all um, linear. And then you see sometimes this, where people map the, the junction spanning reads and then give them the numbers and they have the isoforms at the, at the bottom and you have the, the reads. And the point I want to make is this is, to me, this is not very readable if I want to compare conditions, but you see a lot of papers do that. And uh, basically in the visualization, things that I'll show you, we address those challenges in the sense that this was, we felt was lacking and we need better ways. So specifically, there's either too many or too little details. It's very hard to relate the elements. They're always in fixed scale, linear scale, because that's how the genome browser is built. So introns are huge, exons are tiny, for example. And it's very hard to convey context, variations, and confidence. So if you're thinking something is changing with some confidence, it's very hard using this standard visualization to show it in any meaningful way. OK. And we'll show you our solutions later. We also want it to be easy to interpret and user-friendly. For this, uh, Matt and Jordi are going to show you the various steps. But the idea is that you first build using your RNA-seq data and your transcriptome notation, you do a build of all those splice graphs for all the genes that you can detect, both everything that was known and de novo. Then you compute your psi, your inclusion levels, or, or delta psi, uh, differences in inclusion level. And, and I want to emphasize here, so people who are not into splicing, the way we work is, which is kind of different from gene expression-based methods. So gene expression-based methods try to say the gene is going up, the gene is going down. It's, it's trying to estimate the expression, like the absolute, okay, or relative to other uh, genes or, or between genes, expression levels. What we do here, because we're only looking at splicing, we're always looking at fractions of inclusion. So we're talking about LSVs, we're always talking about the relative inclusion of a specific path so that LSV, 20% versus the rest, okay, 50%. Okay, so it's always a number between zero and uh, 100%. Um, and we can quantify the inclusion level in a specific group or in specific experiments, say 20%, or we can quantify the changes in the relative inclusion between two conditions, which is sometimes uh, a lot of people want to do when, when they compare a knockdown or, or patients and controls, et cetera, and they want to say, oh, this inclusion of this specific element of this protein domain in the, in, in the gene is changing in 20%, okay? And that means something. And then the last step in the pipeline is the visualization. And you'll see all the details later. Okay, and then you'll see this. When I'm not going to uh, cover too much at this point. This is just an overview. Everything is done through HTML5 with interactive... Um, uh, D3 component, so sort of the latest and greatest in web technology. And that means it runs in your browser and you don't need to install special software to visualize this and, 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 and get a sense of how the data looks like. Uh, it also offers you the ability to click and open the genome browser with the raw data so you can go straight from visualizing, visualizing uh, the splice graph that you see here splicing variations for a specific LSV that you see here, and Matt is going to cover it in depth, uh, to the raw reads and any other tracks that you want to see along with it. Okay. So, accurate. So let me just talk briefly about that. So how do you measure accuracy when you don't know it on a genome-wide scale? So in, in, the, in the eLife paper, and a, a, a recent paper that is currently under uh, revision, uh, we, we sort of discuss ways to how do we evaluate whether the algorithms are actually doing what we want them to do. 
And what we suggested in those papers is to use something called reproducibility as a measure for how well the algorithm is doing. And the idea is very intuitive. It's been used a lot in peak calling, in cheap seek, and, and, and identifying uh, driver mutations in cancer and other, other domains. And this is sort of the, uh, if you'd like, the local version or, or flavor of it adopted to this problem. And so the idea is very simple. Let's say you have an algorithm, and the algorithm says, I compare brain and liver, and these are the things that I think are significantly changing between the brain and the liver, or the knockdown of whatever, or the patients and the controls. So how do you know this is actually working without knowing the, the ground truth? And the idea is that you basically repeat the experiment, okay, and you check how reproducible those estimates are. So let's say you go to another mouse and another, uh, uh, two different other mice, and you ask them to donate nicely their brain and their liver, and you do the RNA sec data again, and you do the comparison again, run the algorithm, and see how many of those that you said in the first experiment should be the ones that are changing are reproduced in that second experiment, okay? And you can do this, and the idea is you can ask it for the first 20 that you're most confident about, the 30, 40, et cetera, and see how many of them are reproduced. Okay, of course, the more reproducible the results are, the fraction of those that are reproduced as the best ranking ones would be higher, okay? So the, the y-axis here is always going to be between zero and one. Oops. So that's the, so this is the, what the graph is showing you, between zero and one, so this is the fraction that is reproduced, and the x-axis is how many you are reporting, the first 20, 30, 40, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's the idea. And uh, notice that, you know, different data sets will give you very different results, right? Because maybe the data is more crappy, you did better coverage, less coverage, you had heterogeneity or whatever. So this is not a number that you can say this is reproducibility of an algorithm, but for a specific data set, you can try different algorithms. You don't have to, you know, by my word that the algorithm works nicely. You can try different ones and see how it works. So this is the sort of take-home message about you can try things at home on different algorithms. And, and so this is the comparison we did here um, across uh, mouse tissues. Oops. And you can see the different algorithms, and basically what you're seeing here is the reproducibility by our algorithms is significantly better than other algorithms. These are very commonly used algorithms, uh, MISU and RMATS, that some of you may, may have used in the past. And this is SUPA, and it runs out of annotation here, so it stops. And uh, the, the lines here are the new flavor of the algorithm, where even if you have outliers that might throw the algorithm off, the new version, that's the Norton and Al paper, is robust to that. Uh, much more than other algorithms that have a, a significant drop. Okay, so this is one way that you can evaluate performance and that we've done it in the paper, and that's why we think the algorithm is doing very well in terms of accuracy. Uh, but just note that this alone is not a proof, okay? I want to emphasize this in any shape or form. That's very important, right? Because I can think right now of a very, very simple algorithm uh, that would be completely reproduced. Okay, and the algorithm will work as follows. You give me a list of, you, know, you, you give me an RNA-seq data, I take all your genes, I rank them alphabetically, and I give you that list. Okay? And then you give me another set of RNA-seq data, I rank them alphabetically, and the list is going to be extremely reproducible. Right? So you can see the problem. Okay? And so this alone is not enough. And so the other thing that we've done in, to, to measure how well we're doing is we created mixed conditions where basically there's no signal, okay? So these are basically replicates, a group of replicates that look the same and a group of replicates that look the same. And then we say, based on this is groups that are supposed to be exactly the same. There's a couple of replicates here, a couple of replicates here, exactly the same condition. I don't expect to see any difference between, you know, very little, right, uh, variations. And so this is how many are reported as varying between uh, the two uh, made up no signal comparisons. And this is based on what you'd report from the total is the false discovery rate. So from, if you look at the signal groups, say brain and liver, and then you mix the, you say brain and brain or, 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 or liver and liver, and you see how many are showing up, you're saying, okay, what's the fraction that I'm reporting which should be, should be supposed to be real or false? And then the fraction is the false discovery rate, the expected 
number or the expected fraction of those that I report in a signal case that are supposed to be false. And what you're seeing here is that Magic is performing very well compared to the other experiment, uh, other type of um, algorithms that we tried on this. And different conditions will again give you different numbers, but it seems to be pretty stable. This is again another proof why we think or indicators that the algorithm is performing well. And of course, you need to do independent validations. We did a lot of that in the eLife paper. We had over 200 RT-PCR, which is considered the gold standard in RNA community. And we got very nice correlations and we performed very nicely compared to other algorithms. And you can also see here in this case, this is an update version where we're introducing outliers and we're seeing how sensitive we are and the new algorithm is very robust to that as well. Okay. And um, what did I want to say here? Yeah, I wanted to say that, you know, the different colors. So this is Magic quantification. This is RT-PCR. So you can see this is MISU. That's another algorithm. So the point I want to make here is you can see it's not perfect. It's not supposed to be perfect. This is RNA-seq data and this is RT-PCR. It's not going to be perfect. And the colors represent different data sets. So you can see some are cleaner and they had triplicates and they had repetitions and they were all done by the same um, uh, person that would be Matt over there uh, with his golden hands. So you get very nice. Uh, and, and you know, the others were done by a ton of people across many, uh, 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 several years in, in slightly different conditions. And you can see uh, that's the purple points and you can see less correspondence. So the point is, you're not necessarily going to see perfect correlation in your data, and it's going to vary, but this is a comparison of two, two different. What's the solid line? So the solid line is perfect. So the solid line, sorry. So the dashed line is perfect, right, correspondence. Right. The solid line is fitting a, a linear, uh, so it's, the, it's, the, it's based the, the, the correlation coefficient here. So this is 80 here over all samples, and this is 47 for me. Okay? Does that make sense? This is yeah. if you fit if you fit a line. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't look fit to yours. Well, you have some outliers here that throw it off a bit, and you don't see all the points. Okay. But it's fine. Sorry. Looks like if you fit, if I fit, it looks going to be closer to the line. Well, the data is closer than the line. Kind of Next time we do this, we'll ask you, and we'll get better <laughs> results. And that's the solution. Anyway. Yeah, it's hard to see, and outliers throw those correlations, coefficients off. So even just a few points here and here and here, they're going to throw them off. It's always to keep in mind when you're doing correlations. Okay. You can also test the effect of various coverage levels. So you can see the original uh, samples had about 80 million, and we dropped it down. And uh, we also tested the correlation uh, both for reproducibility, this is this measure, and both for uh, Pearson correlation to RT-PCR. And again, those newly defined, uh, the, the, the new algorithm, which is called here Magic Local Weights, which we're going to explain a bit, uh, performs very well. And the other point I want to make here is that nothing is perfect. So that's another take home message, okay? So, um, uh, one of the questions we got previously is how many reads map to junction spanning reads? And our algorithm rely on those. So if you have very, very low coverage, okay, like you can see here, 20 million, 18 million, or something like that, and you rely on junction spanning reads, eventually you're going to start detecting less and less events, and you don't have replicates, okay? Uh, so you're going to just see less and less junctions, and this is something that to take into account, and this is a case where um, um, you can also play with the thresholds of the algorithm that Matt, Matt is going to talk about. So if you're very conservative, you can see the effect of dropping those numbers from 80 million to 25 million. And you can see in the RT-PCR, we detect basically all of them in the beginning, and it drops all the way to nine with only 20 million. So there's a huge, huge drop. If you relax the parameters that we use for the algorithm in terms of detection, and you allow more, um, uh, so the relaxed definition allows less reads across less number of positions. You can detect more, so it's more stable, uh, and you pay, uh, uh, you might pay uh, a bit of a, a price in terms of uh, correlations. 
um, if you, that you can see here between those two. So the point is you can adjust your parameters and Matt is going to talk about it when you do execution to uh, if you have lower uh, coverage you can relax it get maybe slightly less accurate results but more of detection power and you can play the trade-off of how conservative I am I want to be how accurate those correlations are going to be and reproducible in terms of I go to the experiment and it's going to uh, uh, pan out uh, versus how many I'm, I'm going to be able to detect but there's no free lunches because we detect things based on junction spanning rings if coverage is very very low then other algorithms that say use exon uh, exon reads and assume a transcriptome will have more power of detection. They might be less accurate, but they will be they will be detecting more, which is those previous slides that I showed you. And just to make the point that the novel detection is very important, so I showed you those green arcs before, and I said these are new stuff that are not available in the transcript in the annotated transcriptome, but the algorithm de uh, detects. So what we've seen in that paper is when we use the novel detection in mouse transcriptome, we see uh, an improvement, of course, in human as well, you can see a 30% increase in differentially splicing events detection, and the reproducibility basically stays flat. So that means all those de novo stuff that are unannotated are very real, are very reproducible. And we show validations with RTPCR in the paper as well. So that is basically the boost compared to not using it. And vast majority of the algorithms out there don't give you the novel detection, so they're basically going to miss complex variations, but also the novel variations. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's the million dollar question or more, depending on how you know, how much you have in your NIH budget to sequence. Uh, so no, no, I, I would categorically say no. Uh, sorry, I think the difference is you're used to doing gene expression analysis and gene expression analysis, I think this is fine. And that's what we've seen from our experience. Slicing, you wanna go up. And the reason is exactly because if you think of it, right, if conceptually, intuitively, it's very, it's very simple, right? Because to see a gene, you can hit anywhere in the gene, and you're going to have a ton of reads hitting it, let's just say, right? And then you can, if you look at two different conditions, you can say quite confidently the gene is expressed, not expressed, it's going up, it's going down. To, if you go from that level of a gene to the various isoforms, and you really want to capture them, and you want to hit those splice junction spanning reads, then you need more in order to get more, more of that detected. So what we usually say, sorry? What about right, so we're doing an analysis uh, right now in terms of the advantages and disadvantages. I don't have the answer to you about this. What people tend to recommend is paradigm reads for mappability. I'm actually not sure this is true, uh, but I don't have the numbers. So, Exactly. So, well, you're not doubling your number. So the problem is not doubling the number of junctions. The problem is doubling the number of coin flips, coin throws, right? So th this, no, but uh, so junctions, it's not clear that you're going to hit more junctions with, with uh, single end reads. But what you are doubling for the same amount of sequencing is the number of coin throws in your game. So if you think of it, there's a higher chance to hit the lowly expressed isoforms because you just double the amount of throws, right? Because otherwise, if you think of how many, iso how many transcripts are you hitting, right? In, yes. But you, you, well, you're hitting, the, you're, you're hitting those little uh, things that you chopped off, right? And then you're amplifying them. And so the idea is if you basically, if those are un, um, they're not paired, it's like throwing more coins to try and quantify the various size of forms. So now you will pay a price with mappability and things like that, but I don't have the, you know, I don't have the numbers to tell you. This is a sort of a, 
This is part of a bigger project where the idea is to predict how, how much you need. So this, you know, this is the first step. The next step is you, you want to know how many, if I sequence indefinitely, that's usually a, a question I get, how many differentially spliced events will I find if I had an infinite budget? Right? And, which is a great question. And then where should I stop? So this is about extrapolation. So this is a, a project that we have in the lab, but it's not completed, so I don't have the numbers. And I, we think we have a way to do this, uh, algorithmic way to do this, and that will answer those questions that you just asked, along with those others, more complex ones as well. But I don't have the numbers yet. Yeah, so we usually say, you know, 60 million and, and up, at least. Yeah, that's what we like to see. So the FDR are also similar between the and non Yes, yeah, 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 which is why we're saying, so we, we tend to be rather uh, restrictive about the de novo uh, junctions, and we need to see enough of those. And because of those, you, you know, if you just saw one or two, that's probably not enough. And, you know, Greg uh, there had a paper comparing mappers and, you know, what's their false discovery if they're, you know, observing one read or two reads and how that falls off. So we're rather on the conservative side based on these types of analysis. And this is why I think, you know, when we're finding them and we're actually quantifying them and saying there's a difference, then that's, it's very much real. Yeah. Okay. So fast. So I usually, you know, I put this up when we talk about fast because, you know, this is like a cartoon, you know, kids, bragging and you know one of them says I can compute really fast and you know this this is not very even close but yeah that's like really fast and the reason I like to put this cartoon in is because it seems to be like an ongoing theme nowadays if you read I don't know nature methods and things like that people keep coming up with more and more fast ways and they sort of compete between themselves as who's faster and you know, I don't think fast is bad. We want to make it fast, but you, you know, a lot of those are using pre-annotated transcriptomes and pseudo alignments, and all those assumptions tend to bring break when you start looking at real data with errors in the reads and and um, and the novel stuff that they're not able to capture, like I showed you. So you want it fast, but you also want it accurate. That's the point. And so. Um, to make things faster, we just released um, a new version, which is for every job that we run, it's three to six times faster, but it's also very, very stable on memory process, uh, memory usage for every process that we run. So you can see this is the previous version that we released last year, and this is the new version that we released this year. So that means you can run many, many, many different nodes, processors in parallel and, 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 and each one of them is going to run three to six times faster. So that means the, the scale up of how much faster we're working. And we're working to make it even faster. That's a project uh, that Jordi has been leading. And so you know, we were able to uh, very nicely analyze you know, 1,500 samples uh, from GTEx to, uh, to show this is very doable. And, and this is the kind of data sets that we're currently able to execute. And the previous version was just not it would choke basically on 100 samples. Um, okay, so take home messages. Uh, RNA seq data is, is a wide topic. You need to find the tools that suit your needs. So there's no necessarily universal magic solution for everything. Uh, LSV is a very useful way to think about, uh, detect, and quantify, and visualize transcriptional variations. You hopefully uh, want to consider using these types of tools, which this workshop is about. And your mileage may vary, okay? Uh, you don't need to trust any of the results that we present here. You can try it on your own data and, and see if you, you, know, you think something else will work better for you. I would encourage you to do so. Um, um, and, and take that always, I think it's always, you know, take everything always with a grain of salt. That's, that's a good approach when you read papers. Um, yeah, the evaluation principles that I showed, I think, are very applicable. So whatever data set you're, you need to handle. Um, 
Different goals may call upon different solutions or algorithms. For example, you know, are you trying to get a genome-wide view of the variations? Uh, so maybe all you need is a very crude global, global view of transcriptome variations because you're comparing, say, large populations and, and, and things like that. Some of the papers that you find out there do that. And then maybe you don't need the NOVA for that. Maybe you don't even need very, very accurate quantifications. You don't care about complex at all. You just want to see how subpopulations in here or there differentiated and you had a ton of samples and that's all you care about. So maybe you want to run other tools like SUPA uh, that it, you know, uses a pseudo aligner and then uses their quantifications for full isoforms based on annotated transcriptomes and then looks at ratios at every junction. Okay, and that will just run very fast. Uh, so it will have all those simplifying if, uh, assumptions, but it will run faster. And algorithms, I want to point out that any algorithm that, for example, ignores the NOVO and the complexity that we described and assumes a transcriptome will always work faster. So coming back to that slide before, okay, it's just a given. So we made a sort of philosophical or conscious decision that we want to capture those things and we're going to pay a price by you know, the algorithm being always slower conceptually. Now, it's not going to be in practice always slower because you know, Jody worked very hard in making a very, very nice, uh, elegant implementation, efficient impl implementation, so it might run faster. But uh, keep that in mind. Um, do you need full isoforms? So that's a, you know, a lot of people just want to quantify the isoforms as a, as a, as a, they want to say, I want the full isoforms. But if you can't really quantify them with accuracy, maybe you want to consider, again, LSVs. Do you need alternative polyidentylation? This is something that we don't necessarily capture. So again, you will need other algorithms to do this. And what happens with very low coverage? We talked about that. Um, yeah, so know your tool, what is good for you, uh, how you should be adjusting it, and, and Matt and Jordi are going to describe different scenarios and how you can adjust the tool to maximize it, which is the analysis scenario. Now we're going to go to the next, and I just want to thank all the people in the lab that has been working on this. Matt did all the case studies and helped a lot with the uh, Voila and uh, Magic Spell uh, development, CJ, uh, didn't do the case studies. I don't know why I have this arc, but definitely did the spell. Oops. Alex helped with uh, Vola and with along with CJ uh, and Jordi, uh, the original Magic and Magic Hat, which Scott has been contributing to that uh, in his PhD. And Anu, Anu uh, generated the new splicing codes, which we haven't talked. It's not related to workshop actually, but I forgot. So it's here. Uh, Kristen has been uh, just left the room. She's been extremely helpful with all of this, and she also got us the funding for this workshop uh, to run and record everything, which you're now enjoying from Lexigen. So we want to thank them and our general funding, and thank you for this part. Any questions? Thanks. Yes. You talked a little about sequencing depth necessary. Um, do you recommend different sequencing depths for detection and sort of ratios for the LSVs versus looking for differential expression or differential LSV percentages between conditions. I, you know, I, I found that to do differential, you generally need more than to sort of stabilize those numbers. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you just want to detect the LSVs, the detection itself, so in, it, I, think, I think they're going to talk a bit about that later. Um, um, Magic has built-in filters for what it, for example, defines as reliably detected in the data, right? And so that means it's not just a one-off thing, and it's not, it's very likely not to be a mapper problem or a sequ sequencing uh, artifact, okay? So this is reliably detected. So coming back to your question, if you just want to detect the LSVs, the reliable filter is what is detected in the data. Okay, then there is another level in Magic, which is the quantifiable filter. So the point is, 
if I have a few reads, if you, you know, I read the literature you, and, and they're mapped, they have several reads and they map to different locations, you're going to say, okay, this is real. This actually exists in the data. I would find it if I did RT-PCR, okay? But the problem is, and that comes back to your point, can I reliably quantify what are the ratios? Not just say it's there, but I can say it's with rather confidence it's, you know, 20% versus 80%, and more so when I want to do differential. 